Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here this afternoon to talk to you about my research. Um, I've only got 10 minutes, so I'm not going to mess around. Uh, illegal trade um, in wildlife is a global problem, but it's at its worst in Asia. Demand for endangered species for food, as pets, and for traditional Chinese medicine is growing. Hong Kong's geographic location makes it a gateway to China. It is an extremely attractive territory to smugglers. It is recognized globally as a wildlife trading hub. And in seeking to address that, the Hong Kong government recently passed amendments to CAP 586, that's the Protection for Endangered Species of Plants and Animals Ordinance, which have raised the maximum penalty for the most endangered species to 10 years imprisonment. Will this be enough to counter a trade that has been ranked as the fourth most lucrative black market in the world? In Hong Kong, seizures equating to $100 million are made every year. The average value of these seizures is now second only to the average value in dangerous drugs. Yet there is no special unit to counter wildlife crime. There are no specialist prosecutors to deal with wildlife cases. There is no specialized environmental court. And it is not yet regarded, if it ever will be, as what it is, which is organized and serious crime in the most part. In Asia, as in many parts of the world, anthropocentric attitudes apply to animals. Wildlife crime is not considered to be a serious crime, and animals are not regarded as real victims. And this view, unfortunately, is supported by CITES, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. This convention is intended to penalize trade beyond sustainable levels and manage natural resources for human benefit. Accordingly, CITES, and indeed the Convention on Biological Diversity, do not seek to protect wildlife for the sake of the animals themselves. These treaties are hampered in their ability to deal with wildlife crime by their conservation objectives. In adopting conservation biology principles to address harm, they favor only the level of threat to an animal. They focus on the level at a specific given time and manage access from that basis. The conventions, therefore, are largely silent as to the welfare needs of animals and the problems that arise in capture, transport, and poaching. Unfortunately, this has resulted in the exclusion of even highly endangered species welfare interests from in international instruments. Can domestic legislation fill this gap? Domestic animal cruelty laws can, of course, only address cruelty that is suffered within the jurisdiction in which the law is passed. Of course, smuggling charges might be laid, but local laws like CAP 586 largely reflect back only the concerns of CITES, in other words, they focus on conservation harms rather than welfare harms. To respond to wildlife crime effectively, we need local, local cruelty laws to routinely to be applied in cases where animals have been smuggled illegally into the territory. But this would require not only that police, but customs officers recognize cruelty to wildlife and move beyond CITES concerns but it would also require judges and prosecutors to recognize animal cruelty in relation to wild animals. And that is a matter of knowledge and expertise. To this end, we are assisted to some extent by an expanding notion in the law as to who might be a victim. New societal attitudes allow for harms to human victims to be recognized by courts even where prosecutions have not taken place and convictions have not been recorded. But for animals, the situation is different. Animals are traditionally excluded from victim status. They have a lack of standing under the law, and their property status allows them to be forfeited, transferred, euthanized, but doesn't necessarily recognize their welfare needs. Very occasionally, harm to ecosystems are addressed by restoration or compensation orders, but it's highly unusual for direct welfare harms to be recognized in environmental law. 
An alternative view is granted by an emerging new field, green criminology. With its focus on eco-justice, green criminology provides that humans are only one part of a complex ecosystem. Once we recognize that, we can begin to acknowledge both the direct harms to animals in trade, through poaching and transport, and the indirect harms to non-target species and habitats through removal of endangered animals and plants. This approach is consistent with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and our increasing understanding as humans of our responsibilities to other species. Unfortunately, studies by traffic and others have repeatedly shown that there is limited understanding of the effects of wildlife crime within key personnel in the criminal justice system. And I'm talking, of course, of the prosecutors and the judges. And a lack of understanding naturally impedes deterrent sentencing. Now, I am a lawyer, so I have a conflict. I'm also a prosecutor. But I am going to tell you, quite honestly, that not all of this is the lawyer's fault. In part, it is a result of gaps in the scientific literature. Unlike the domestic species, sufficient robust studies have not always been done to allow experts to agree on the objective welfare needs and even the ecological impacts of poaching and trade on some of the rarest species of wild animals. But where that data does exist, greater effort could be involved in effectively translating it to a form accessible and understandable to police, to lawyers, to judges and prosecutors involved in wildlife crime cases. In recent years, a practice has begun to develop in Scotland. And this practice allows for preparation of victim impact statements for species and ecosystems in environmental crime. The Crown Office has begun to seek reports on the impact of wildlife crime from NGOs in Scotland, including Scottish National Heritage. And these victim impact statements include the societal, economic, and the species harms that are caused by wildlife offending. As a result, judges receive information that improves their capacity to recognize the impact of wildlife crime, and prosecutors are starting to notice an increase in deterrent sentencing. A review of this practice in 2015 by the Wildlife Crime Penalties Review Group called on the Scottish Government to promote this practice by giving it legislative footing. Whilst that has not happened, the Scottish Government has publicly declared this to be a success in their ability to combat, to combat environmental crime and called on prosecutors and judges to increase what is and was an ad hoc practice and increasingly is becoming common. In 2015, I started to explore the possibility for developing wildlife trade impact statements to assist our prosecutors and judges in Hong Kong. Wildlife crime, as I've said, is a very significant problem here. Since 2000, over 40 tons of illegal ivory have been seized. Lax controls on trade, including the continual allowance for so-called pre-CITES ivory, have made the city one of the largest ivory markets in the world. It is also the point of seizure of much of the pangolin trade due to demand for traditional Chinese medicine. Scales seized here over the last six years represent the deaths of over 100,000 pangolins. Less well known is that Hong Kong takes 80% of the regional live fish trade, much of which is endangered and smuggled in contravention of regional export quotas. In response, I began working with biologists at the Kaduri Farm and Botanical Garden to draft impact statements for the territory's most smuggled species. In Hong Kong, most of the smuggling relates to smaller, lesser known animals. So we designed statements for 50 rare, critically endangered species, including turtles and tortoises, all eight species of pangolin, and several species of fish. Our statements provide reliable scientific knowledge for judges and prosecutors, giving them the tools to respond effectively to wildlife crime. Going forward, we're continuing to add new species to our statement list and developing a new section on the possible forensic tests available to assist with prosecutions, 
thanks to the work of the School of Biological Sciences Wildlife Crime Forensics Lab. In adopting this multidisciplinary approach, we hope to improve the transfer of knowledge between scientists and lawyers. We're not seeking to challenge established practices. We don't envisage that our species impact statements will ever be handed up to judges in the way that they currently are as a matter of practice in Scotland. But they can be used to inform prosecutions and sentencing decisions. It's early days, but we are hopeful that the statements will have a positive effect on the understanding within the criminal justice system of the right, wide ranging harms that are done to animals in illegal trade. So my message is quite simple. Conservation science can and should be used to inform sentencing for wildlife crime, and in doing so, we'll we will improve access to environmental justice. Thank you for listening. <laughs>